Hello everyone, this is Al, Red Sox fan, coming to you from Al, Red Sox fan, YouTube channel. And we're going to bring you some Legends of Boxing PC game. We had an 11 fight card from Springfield, Massachusetts, Pynchon Park. And now we're going to give you our four televised and radio uh, fights. But let's go through what happened before these four fights. And they are tremendous, our four fights. The main event. Marvelous Marvin Hagler will defend his title against Paul Pender, both pugilists from Massachusetts. Willie Pep from Connecticut will defend his world championship against Battling Badalino, both pugilists from Connecticut. Marlon Starling, Tony DeMarco, their rematch for the United States Boxing Association welterweight title. They fought to a draw. Starling from Connecticut, DeMarco from Boston, Massachusetts. Up in our first USBA championship fight for the junior welterweight title, Mickey Ward from the mean streets of Lowell, Massachusetts, takes on Gene Hatcher, the man from the great state of Texas. Hatcher is the champion. But what happened in the prior seven fights? We started off with Eric Butterbean Esch taking on former heavyweight contender, a man who fought George Foreman in real life and was knocked out. In Japan, Jose Roman, and they fought to a draw. Roman dropped Esh in the final round, catching him with a beautiful counter. Roman with practically no punching power, but he caught him with a beautiful counter, dropping Esh. Esh had dropped Roman earlier in the bout, and that was a draw. 93-95, favoring Roman in the 94-94 even. 95-93, favoring Eric butterbean -Ash. So a draw. John Dino Dennis, looking for his first win in our universe from Boston, Massachusetts, took on another Massachusetts native, Peter McNeely, and he wrecked him, TKO'd him in one round. So Peter McNeely does what he does, loses in fabulous fashion. Marvis Frazier was on the card, trying to rebound off a loss, and he did by beating Lorenzo Zanone of Italy. Majority points victory for Marvis Frazier, son of Smoking Joe Frazier. First judge had it even 96-96. The next two, 97-95, 98-93, Marvis Frazier. Lou Salika out of New York defeated Sun Kil Moon out of South Korea. And it was a close tussle, but a unanimous decision for Salika. 96-95, 96-94, 96-94. Vinny Pazienza of Providence, Rhode Island, took on Dooku Kim of South Korea. And Kim upset Pazienza by majority decision. We had Kim winning uh, on our scorecard pretty handily. But the judges had it 96-95 for Kim, 95-95 even, and 98-93 for Kim. Kim was able to hurt Pazienza on quite a few occasions. Pazienza played to the crowd a little bit too much here at Pynchon Park in Springfield, Massachusetts. A lot of Rhode Island natives come down to watch. And uh, they were none too happy in the Pazienza corner with that defeat. So back to the drawing board for Vinny Pazienza. Donnie Lalonde battered M M uh, Emilio Bettina, stopping him in the fourth round. He, he did a job on Bettina, chopped him up quite good. A bloody Bettina was halted in round four at the 111 mark when the referee stepped in and stopped the bout. Then Jack Sharkey, making his debut in our Legends of Boxing universe, defeated father of Peter McNeely, Tom McNeely, TKO third round on cuts. So a good job by Jack Sharkey. Now to our final four bouts. Up first, Mickey Ward, Gene Hatcher, and this will be for the United States Boxing Association Junior Welterweight title. Hatcher won the title when he defeated Billy Costello. Actually, Hatcher, excuse me, Hatcher, excuse this is a vacant title. Hatcher is going to try to take the USBA title. Hatcher is the North American Boxing Federation champion also. So Gene Hatcher will try to claim another regional title here. This title is vacant, excuse me. Irish, Mickey Ward, Lowell, Massachusetts, overall record, 
and oh with 27 stoppages fought that trilogy with arturo Gotti, losing two out of three gene mad dog hatcher former junior welterweight champion in reality when he beat johnny bump city bumpus in buffalo new york upset of the year when it happened 32 7 and 0 with 23 stoppages both men are 1 and 0 in our universe and again this bout is taking place at Pynchon Park in Springfield, Massachusetts. To the ring we go. Mickey Ward is in the red corner. Gene Hatcher, Mad Dog Hatcher, in the blue corner. 12 rounds, United States Boxing Association title on the line. This is a vacant title. My faux pas, Gene Hatcher is the North American Boxing Federation champion. So he'll try to, again, as we stated, win two regional titles and put himself in line for a world championship shot which is also vacant irish mickey ward will have a slight edge in stamina gene mad dog hatcher a slight edge in power control is even stevens so it should be a slobber knocker slug fest ward likes to work on the inside predominantly and bring some pressure Hatcher is the same way. He's going to fight in, in, in and bring the pressure. So this fight could be fought in a phone booth. They touch gloves. They go back to their corners. Here we go for round number one. Ward likes to left hook to the body and bring it to the head. He's a devastating left hook puncher to the body and also has a good right cross. Gene Hatcher likes to get in tight, work the hooks, and the uppercut. Round one, scheduled for 12. Mickey Ward takes control. As they're fighting on the inside, Hatcher bipping and bopping, but Ward throws a combination and lands, grazing shots, but it was a good combination. Ward again, getting his punches off. Big left hook to the body, right hook to the body. Then he brings the right hand. It's a chopping right hand to the head of Gene Hatcher. Mickey Ward trying to back up Hatcher. Lead right cross and a left to the body. Good job by Mickey Ward. Hatcher looks to retaliate. He misses the combination. Ward comes back with a solid left hook to the jaw of Gene Hatcher. Hatcher backs up a bit. Ward pursues. Hatcher stands his ground, wings a couple of hooks. Ward gets underneath. They tie up and break. Now it's Mickey Ward again. A left hook to the body, and he brings the right uppercut, splitting the guard of Mad Dog Gene Hatcher. Excellent round for Mickey Ward. Many fans traveled from Lowell, Massachusetts here to Springfield to witness this bout. Toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange, under a minute to go. Hatcher trying to rally. Hatcher again throws and misses. And Mickey Ward doubles up with the left hook. One into the ribs and then brings it quickly to the jaw of Gene Hatcher. Mickey Ward looking very sharp. Final moments here in round number one. And finally, Gene Hatcher scores a combination on the inside. A huge round for Mickey Ward. Excellent round for Irish Mickey Ward. Dick Eklund, his stepbrother, is in the corner of Mickey Ward. Round number two, scheduled for 10. And again, it's Mickey Ward coming right out at Gene Hatcher. Hatcher is the USB. Actually, he is the USBA champion. My faux pas again. Beautiful combination as you see the belt up top by Mickey Ward. He rat-a-tats the ribs of Gene Hatcher, playing them like a drum. Three-punch salvo. Excellent job by Mickey Ward. Hatcher. Oh, Hatcher went low. He's trying to stop Mickey Ward by any means necessary. The referee warns him. Another good toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange there at ring center, fighting, trying to work the angles on the inside. Hatcher letting his hands go a little more freely than he did in round one. He got quite a tongue lashing in his corner. Excellent body work by Gene Hatcher. Ward looks to come right back, and he does. Left hook to the ribs and quickly up to the jaw of Gene Hatcher. Hatcher absorbs it well. Mickey Ward wings a left hook. Hatcher ducks underneath. No counter by Gene Hatcher. Ooh! Mickey Ward fainted with a jab and catches Hatcher with a right uppercut, snapping his head. Under a minute to go here in round number two. Mickey Ward wings a right, then a left. He misses. Gene Hatcher lands a good short right on the inside. Good job by Gene. Ten seconds to go here in round number two. And it's Mickey Ward doubling up that hook to the body. That left hook, it's an educated hook. 
as he tries to find the liver shot that will drop Gene Hatcher. Another good round for Mickey Ward. Hatcher had his moments a bit better than round one, but our eyes, he lost both rounds. We'll take a look at the ringside score. Again, this is an unofficial ringside score. 10-9 for both rounds for Mickey Ward. Irish Mickey Ward from Lowell, Massachusetts. Gene Mad Dog Hatcher trying to retain his title from Fort Worth, Texas. Round three, scheduled for 12. They tie up, they move away from one another as they jostle inside. They're trying to get the angles on one another. Beautiful shots by Mickey Ward. Gene Hatcher comes right back. That was a beautiful toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange as Hatcher countered off the Ward hook and landed a right and a left hook to the head of Mickey Ward. But the Irishman is undeterred. Lead right hand lands square in the face of Gene Hatcher and then a left catches his on the schnoz. Hatcher blinks, but there is no blood. Hatcher looks to come back. Hatcher digs a left of the body and a right uppercut through the guard of Mickey Ward. Ward has a very bad cut, a tremendously horrific cut above the right eye, and that blood is hampering his vision. Gene Hatcher has his moment in the sun. Can he take advantage of it? Ward comes right back, digging a left, a right, and another left to the body of Gene Hatcher. Ward having trouble with that blood. Hatcher lands a left and again that right uppercut. Beautiful combination. That's the combination that busted up Mickey Ward. Hatcher trying to take advantage of toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange, but Ward got the better of it. The right hand clipped Hatcher in that toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange right on the chin. 30 seconds to go. A lead cross and a left hook by Gene Hatcher. 10 seconds to go. Excellent action here, and that blood is flowing into the Mickey Ward eye. And there you have it. A couple of hooks were missed by Mickey Ward. He goes back to the corner. Dick Eklund quickly gets his brother on the stool, and they go to work on that horrific cut above the right eye. And I shall be back in a moment. And we are back as there is a delay as they're looking at the gloves of Mickey Ward. We prepare for round number four. That blood is going to really affect Mickey Ward. Here's the bell for round number four. Ward looking to do something here as they don't know how long they'll be able to go with that horrific cut in the Hatcher corner. They're selling, telling him, take him out, Gene. And Hatcher swarms Mickey Ward as Ward presses forward lead right hand by gene hatcher and then a left hook to the body and he brings it quickly to the head hatcher continues to throw banging the body in the right uppercut splits the guard of mickey ward snapping his head again and the blood starts to flow above the right eye toe to toe exchange even exchange hatcher swarming ward ward swarming hatcher ward loads up on the left hook digs it hard to the body and brings it to the jaw of gene mad dog hatcher they tie up, and you can see the blood all over the right side of the face of Mickey Ward. That's coming from the cut that was sustained by the right uppercut in the prior round thrown by Gene Hatcher. Ward having a lot of trouble with that cut. They tie up again, and the referee breaks them. Mickey Ward throws a wild combination as he shoves Hatcher off balance. He, he landed a chopping right hand and a grazing left. Toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange again, under 10 seconds to go here. Gene Hatcher at the bell, a left hook to the body, and a right uppercut. Snapping the head of Irish Mickey Ward. Gene Hatcher might have stole that round with that combo at the end. Four rounds in the book, scheduled for 12. Let's take a look at the ringside score. First two rounds for Ward, next two rounds for Hatcher. It's even Stevens. 
They continue to work on that very bad cut above the eye of Irish Mickey Ward in his corner. The man from Lowell, Massachusetts. Round five, scheduled for 12. Both fighters on the inside trying to work the angles. Hatcher works his hands free, left right to the body, and now a left hybrid hook uppercut. Nailing Mickey Ward in the face. Hatcher continues to punch. Chopping right hand and a left hook to the body. This is phone booth warfare at ring center. Again, they jostle inside trying to grapple for position. Toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange by both fighters. But it's definitely Gene Hatcher, the stronger of the two at the moment. That blood is really bothering Mickey Ward. Mickey Ward lands a solid left hook to the body. And he, again, he quickly brings it to the jaw of Gene Hatcher on the inside. Ward again with a left hook to the body. Now a right uppercut snapping the head of Gene Hatcher, the man from Fort Worth, Texas. Hatcher looks to retaliate. And Hatcher ratatats Mickey Ward with a four-punch salvo. Left hook to the body, right hand to the head, left hook to the head, and another right hand to the head. Final seconds here in round five, and it's Gene Hatcher punching away to the body, and then the uppercut to the head. So Hatcher is getting stronger while Irish Mickey Ward is wearing down. Both fighters have exerted a lot of energy in this bout. But that cut, one that cut happened in round number three, I believe it was round three, or round four actually, it changed the whole complexion of this fight. We're coming up on round six, scheduled for 12, USBA Junior Welterweight Championship on the line. Round six, there's the bell. Hatcher comes out, again it's phone booth warfare. Ward really pressing. He's got to land something big here, but it's Gene Hatcher. Left hook, right hook, and another left right. Ward shakes his head, though the blood begins to flow again above the right eye. Hatcher undeterred, works that body, and then snaps the head of Mickey Ward. That cut, there's no way you can stop that cut. Toe-to-toe -to -toe flurry, but it's Hatcher who got the better of it. Ward begrudgingly giving ground. Hatcher digs to the belt line. We have about a minute 30 to go here in round number six. Ward trying to mount some offense here. Chopping right hand left of the body and a left uppercut to the head of Gene Hatcher. Another toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange. Phone booth bloody warfare ring center here at Pynchon Park in Springfield, Massachusetts. One minute to go in round six. Hatcher bangs left right to the body. And then up to the head with the same combination. Hatcher continues to fire. Chopping one, two in tight to the head. Hatcher pressing Ward back. Hatcher digs hard to the body and there's the bell. Hatcher again getting stronger and stronger. Mickey Ward fading. Fading into the night. Can he land that hellacious left hook to the body? That so many times did tremendous damage to his opponent's He's got to land the big left hook. We are through six rounds. Hatcher, we have feel, have, has taken rounds three through six. Let's see if the ringside score agrees. He does. Mickey Ward took the first two rounds. Looked very good. Round three went to Hatcher at the end. Round four, Hatcher busted him up with that left hook to the body and the right uppercut. That caught Ward. And produced a gash above his right eye. You can see Dick Eklund, his brother, his stepbrother in the corner, along with the cut man working on that eye. Joining us at ringside, Brian Patterson and JAA. JAA says Hatcher was hacking him up. He sure is. Brian Patterson, awesome. A live stream for the drive home. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Round seven. Scheduled for 12. Hatcher trying to retain his title here in Springfield, Massachusetts at Pynchon Park. Ward looking to change the tide of battle. There's that left hook to the body, and he quickly brings it. Hybrid uppercut hook to the head of Gene Hatcher. Good combination. Ward letting his hands go. Lead right. Catches Hatcher, and then the left hook to the body. He digs that hard into the Hatcher rib cage. Ward... Again with that left hook to the body. Good job by Mickey Ward. Hatcher looking to retaliate. They're working the angles in tight ring center. And Hatcher, left hook to the body, right uppercut, right uppercut, nails. 
Ward squarely in the face. Blood continues to flow from that horrific gash above the Mickey Ward eye, right eye. Ward comes back. Ratatats Hatcher, left to the body, left to the head, right hand and another left to the head. Four punch salvo by Mickey Ward. Ward continues to punch. Hatcher starts to give a little ground. Ward digs the left into the rib cage. Ward trying to move forward. Toe to toe exchange. Hatcher again begrudgingly gives ground. Hatcher looks to stand his ground. Lead right, left hook, and another right. Smacks Mickey Ward in the face. What a war here. Final 15 seconds. Right cross, left hook, right cross, and Gene Hatcher has blood coming from the mouth. And that will conclude round seven. So Mickey Ward dug deep into his reserves. A huge round for Mickey Ward. Definitely scored the stronger blows, had Hatcher going back, but still has not hurt Gene Hatcher. Both fighters are bloody, though Ward the worst of the two with that nasty cut above the right eye. Hatcher bleeding near the mouth. You really can't stop that. He's just going to hopefully not swallow too much of that blood. Let's go to the ringside score. They give that round to Mickey Ward. I am in agreement there, and I am in agreement with the ringside score. Gene Hatcher, the USBA Junior Welterweight Champion, 67. Mickey Ward, the challenger. Irish Mickey Ward from Lowell, Massachusetts, Massachusetts, the mean streets of Lowell, 66. So Ward is still in it. Ward is still in it. Round 8, scheduled for 12. Hatcher trying to come out and take control once again. And there's that combination that busted up Mickey Ward. Left to the body in that quick uppercut. Again, they're staying on the inside. If the styles make fights, this makes a war. These two are banging and banging. Now Mickey Ward goes low, and there's some boos from the crowd. Not about the low blow, but about the referee admonishing the man from Lowell, Massachusetts. Crowd not happy with that. And Gene Hatcher comes back to the belt line. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Some terse words between the two now. Mickey Ward lands the left hook to the body and a chopping right hand inside. This is Phone Booth Warfare Ring Center here at Pynchon Park in Springfield, Massachusetts. Mickey Ward throws, misses. Gene Hatcher bangs the body hard with a left right as he dipped underneath and came up fighting. Hatcher looks to continue to punch a right to the head and a left to the body, both hooks. Hatcher pressing in on Ward, working the angles. Works his hands free and there's a double left hook. Snapping the head of Mickey Ward. Gene Hatcher pouring it on under 15 seconds to go. Ward comes back with a right cross and a left hook to the jaw of Gene Hatcher. Final moments here in round number eight. And it's Mickey Ward banging away at the bell. Mickey Ward rallies, but I don't think it was enough. Big combination by Mickey Ward. He goes back to his stool. His brother Dick Eklund gets him on the stool and immediately after, since that cut has happened, as soon as they get Mickey Ward on the stool, they quickly go to work on that horrific cut above the right eye. They've done a very good job. It has not gotten worse, but it's not getting better. In the Hatcher corner, they want Gene to work and work hard. That's the only way he knows how to fight. Joining us at ringside, Jim L. Hope all is well. HC0023, Hope all is well. Jeff Ray. Hope all is well. We have JAA and Brian Patterson. Let's go to the ringside score. I give that round. I thought Hatcher held on to that round. Even. Ringside score held, uh, gives round eight even. So it's 76-77 unofficially for Gene Hatcher. I can see that. I'm not going to argue with that. Round nine scheduled for 12. Hatcher defending his USBA junior welterweight title. Here's the bell. Toe to toe exchange, ring center again. This phone booth warfare, that's all I can say. Big shot missed by Mickey Ward. He winged the left. Hatcher ducked, but then Ward caught him with a right hand, a grazing right hand, but a scoring blow. Hatcher comes back, digs the body hard, right hand, left hook, right hand to the head. Ward is stunned. He's not seeing those punches. Ward's not seeing those punches. Hatcher looks to follow up. 
and he does. He digs that left into the ribs of Mickey Ward, and then the right uppercut. Again, that is a combination that has busted up Ward throughout this bout. Ward backs up. He is blinking. The, bl the blood is bothering him. Hatcher continues to fire away with hooks to the body and then quickly up to the head. Ward begrudgingly giving ground. Toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange, but it's Hatcher who's moving forward and Ward who's moving back. Under a minute to go here in round nine. Another toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange. Hatcher will not be denied. Both fighters throw and miss. Seconds remaining. Ward at the bell, and he lands a left hook to the body. Another good round for Gene Hatcher. Mind you, he is getting caught as he fights this way. I mean, both fighters are going to be hit. But this is a fan-friendly fight, toe-to-toe -to -toe action. The blood has really hindered Mickey Ward. But you have to give credit to the man from Fort Worth, Texas, Gene Mad Dog Hatcher. Round nine goes to Hatcher. We're in agreement with that. Mickey Ward breathing quite heavily. A packed capacity here at Pynchon Park in Springfield, Massachusetts. 17,500. Round 10, scheduled for 12. USBA Junior Welterweight title on the line. Hatcher the champion, Ward the challenger. And Mickey Ward! Again, Mickey Ward goes low. And the referee gives him a stern warning now. I think one more, they'll take a point away. The fans boo the referee for... The stern warning. Hatcher comes back, throws, lands a grazing shot to the body and head. Ward comes back with a beautiful right uppercut and a left hook into the ribs of Gene Mad Dog Hatcher. Ward following up. Beautiful combination. Double left hook to the body and then a right into the ribs of Gene Hatcher. Ward again pressing forward. Hatcher trying to stand his ground. Right cross, left hook, right cross by Mickey Ward. So Ward comes back like an angry honey badger. Hatcher, the man from Texas, and again the left hook to the body and the right uppercut snapping the head of Mickey Ward. And that eye is just getting much worse. The referee really looking. It's puffed up. It's bloody. They're streaming from the Hatcher corner. Get him, Gene. Get him. And Mickey Ward goes to the Franks and Beans. And as we stated, there's the point deduction. Ward has to slow down Gene Hatcher. Ward having a conversation with the referee. Referee clearly indicating that punch was low, and as we saw it, it was low. Hatcher getting a few moments here. Now he says he's ready to go. 42 seconds left in round 10. Hatcher going for the kill. And Mickey Ward again goes low. And the referee says one more time, you might be DQ'd. Hatcher, he is mad, and he's not going to take it anymore. 24 seconds to go. They tie up. Hatcher rabbit punching. Now the referee breaks them. Final seconds. Gene Hatcher lands the left to the body and the right uppercut. And a little pushing and shoving before the pugilists go back to their corners. A bloody swollen Mickey Ward lost two points for low blows. In the Hatcher corner, his train I think his trainer was Dave Gorman, if I remember correctly. Dave Gorman is going insane, screaming at the referee about the tactics used by Irish Mickey Ward. We'll go to the ringside score in a moment. And it's going to be, a, I, I believe, a 10-7 round. It should be a 10-7 round for Gene Hatcher. Oh, wow. They gave that round... They made it a 9-8 round. So they gave that round to Mickey Ward, but then he lost two points. I gave that round to Gene Hatcher. So either way, Hatcher takes the round with six more minutes of violence. 96 Hatcher, 93 Mickey Ward. What a fight. Here we go. Round 11, USBA Junior Welterweight title. Mickey Ward comes out winging wildly, catching Hatcher with a grazing punch. Hatcher comes out of the crouch again with that beautiful left to the body and a right uppercut snapping the head of Mickey Ward. That eye of Ward is horrific. Ward trying to land something big. There's the left to the body, but the right hand grazed 
Gene Hatcher again, toe-to-toe -to -toe phone booth warfare ring center as both pugilists try to work the angles on the inside. Toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange, crowd comes to their feet. Both fighters wing and miss, they maul and brawl. Trying to get those angles, and that is it! Another low blow, and the referee has seen enough. He has disqualified Mickey Ward, and Gene Hatcher and Mickey Ward are still going at it. The seconds have come into the ring. We have a mini riot here at Pynchon Park in Springfield, Massachusetts. The police have entered the ring, and order is being restored. So Gene Hatcher looked like he was on the verge of TKOing Irish Mickey Ward, known for dirty tactics. A third low one, two, I, was that the third or fourth? Well, it was more than three low blows. So I believe that was the fourth or fifth intentional low blow in the eyes of the referee. And that was enough. A battered, bloody Mickey Ward is DQ'd. It was a close fight, but... Hatcher was starting to pull away. Hatcher will retain his United States Boxing Association Junior Welterweight title via DQ. So Mickey Ward does not get TKO'd or knocked out, but he does take the loss. But in his mind, maybe it's better that it's a disqualification and not an outright loss in his eyes. To us, it's an outright loss. Let's go to the ringside scorer. 96-93, and then Ward is DQ'd in the 11th for the low blows. Jeff Race is a riot. Love it. Oh, there was a riot, Jeff, here in Springfield, Massachusetts at Pynchon Park. By the way, Pynchon Park no longer exists. It was a minor league baseball. They had minor league uh, football there years ago. High school football. College football many, 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 many years ago. Um... It burnt down in the mid-60s. But I figured we'd have a fight at Pynchon Park. Why not? Let's go to the judges. War, um, I'm sorry. Gene Hatcher was ahead on all the cards. 96-93, 96-93, 97-93. Ninety points were very close. 71-68. That's scoring points on punches. Not necessarily the punches landed in my eyes because no one just lands one punch. Sometimes you do. If when I see something that says one punch, I, in my mind they landed two. Maybe one punch was better than the other, but that's the way I look at it. So Gene Hatcher retains his USBA Junior Welterweight Championship via DQ and the police have to escort Hatcher and the referee out towards the back of the stadium as the fans are hurling things at Gene Mad Dog Hatcher, his corner men, and the referee. But all in all, a just decision by the referee. Up next, a rematch for the United States Boxing Association welterweight title. Marlon Starlin from Connecticut and Tony DeMarco from Massachusetts, Starling from Hartford, DeMarco from Boston will clash once again. They fought to a draw the first time, and now someone hopes to claim this USBA welterweight title. If you're just joining us, our first seven bouts were offline. Eric Butterbean Ash fought a draw with Jose King Roman. Roman actually fought for the heavyweight title against George Foreman and got crushed in Japan. Uh, both fighters went down. Roman knocked down Esch in the 10th, and that saved the draw there for Roman. As one judge had it for Roman, one judge had it for Esch, and one judge had it even. John Dino Dennis from Boston, Massachusetts, and Peter McNeely uh, from, I think it's Medford, Massachusetts. Well, Peter McNeely does what Peter McNeely does. He gets knocked out early, and John Dino Dennis gets his first win in the universe. Peter McNeely's still looking for his. Marvis Frazier, desperately looking for a win, had a thrilling fight. With Lorenzo Zanone of Italy, Frazier won a majority points decision as he outworked Zanone, but Zanone tried his best. In a Bantamweight matchup, so our first three matchups were heavyweights. In a Bantamweight matchup, Lou Salika out of New York won a unanimous close decision against Sung Kil Moon of South Korea. And that, in what was a highly anticipated bout, even though it was not televised or on the radio, Vinny Pazienza of Rhode Island, 
Providence, Rhode Island, here up in New England, took on Dugu Kim of South Korea. Pazienza, the local favorite and the betting favorite, was upset by Dugu Kim as Pazienza played a little too much to the crowd while Kim was throwing punches. Kim won a majority decision, 96-95, 98-93, and then 95-95. Our unofficial scorecard was more in line to the 98-93. We actually had it 97-94. Donnie Lalonde stopped Milio Bettina. Donnie Lalonde, light heavyweight, out of Canada. TKO'd Bettina, who got battered for four rounds, and he was beaten into a bloody submission. Jack Sharkey, Boston heavyweight, taking on Tom McNeely, father of Peter McNeely, in an all-Massachusetts heavyweight clash. Well... The McNeelys didn't do too well tonight as Jack Sharkey stopped McNeely on cuts in round three. And as you just witnessed, Gene Hatcher via DQ of Mickey Ward, though he might have been on the verge of stopping him due to that horrific cut. And Ward just went one too many times to the Franks and Beans. And the referee had seen enough and DQ'd him after taking points away. So 12 rounds up next. United States Boxing Association Welterweight Championship, Marlon Starlin and Tony DeMarco. Let's go to the preview. Marlon Starlin, in reality, 45-6-1 with 27 stoppages out of Hartford, Connecticut. I actually met Marlon Starlin at a boxing card at the Springfield Civic Center. A very nice man, years ago. Uh, he's had one bout. It was the draw to DeMarco. DeMarco's had one bout. The draw to Starlin. Tony DeMarco, both are former welterweight champions in reality. Uh, Tony DeMarco, 58-12-1 with 33 stoppages, had those big fights with Carmen Basilio. DeMarco, this is going to be another really good contest. DeMarco, uh, everything's even here. DeMarco, a slight edge in power. DeMarco... He likes to get inside and hook, 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 bang the body, come up to the head. Marlon Starling, a very a good defensive fighter. That's where he has a big edge over DeMarco. And he likes to throw combinations and work off the jab. Starling can fight cute on the inside or very good on the outside. Um, he's, a, he's a good fighter. I always liked Marlon Starling. To ring center we go here in Springfield, Massachusetts at Pynchon Park, the ballpark. So Marlon Starling will be out of the red corner. Tony DeMarco, the blue corner. Final instructions from the referee. They touch gloves. And once again, the USBA title, the vacant title on the line. They fought to a draw in Connecticut at the Yale Blow. On the, at the Yale Bowl, excuse me, on a Gene Tunney title defense undercard. Here we go. Round one. And it is... Marlon Starling, who has a slight edge in control, taking control. Starling on the inside is a cute fighter on the inside. There it is. He keeps his guard up tight, and he lands a left-right in tight, the left to the body, the right to the head of Tony DeMarco. Again, phone booth warfare here in round number one. Big toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange. Both fighters landed cleanly, neither with an edge. DeMarco now working hard. Lands a grazing hook to the body. Starling keeps his arms in tight. Another toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange. Good action here in round number one. Marlon Starling, chopping right hand and a left uppercut, splits the guard of Tony DeMarco. DeMarco, not a defensive whiz. Starling, a jab and a right hand catches DeMarco. Starling working the angles beautifully on the inside. DeMarco starting to get chopped down, it looks like. But as I say that, Tony comes right back with a four-punch flurry. Two to the body, then the right hand to the head, and then the left to the head. Good job by Tony DeMarco. DeMarco pushing Starling back a bit. And DeMarco with a lead right getting through the Starling guard. And then the left under the elbow of Starling into the rib cage. Ten seconds to go in round number one. A spirited round by both pugilists. And there's the bell. DeMarco complains about a low blow. The referee says it was belt line. That was a tough round to score, possibly even. Slight edge to DeMarco. Jeff Ray says 
He is going with Starling in this one. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Phantom Fighter, how are you doing? Is going with Starling in this one. Check out that wonderful channel. DeMarco took round one. We see it that way. The ringside scorer sees it that way. Again, our cards are unofficial. Round two, scheduled for 12. And it's Tony DeMarco now on the outside. Starling, hands high, trying to move in. DeMarco lands a nice combination, but Starling is able to clip some of those with his gloves. Both fighters looking to work the angles as Starling tries to get inside. DeMarco tries to find an opening. Toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange, even exchange by both fighters. Starling gets past the DeMarco defense with a lead right and then a left uppercut snapping the head of Tony DeMarco. They tie up. Referee says fight out of it. They don't. Referee breaks them. Minute to go here in round number two. DeMarco misses with a jab in the right hand. Good defense by Starling. Again, he is cute. He keeps his gloves up high and he'll parry away punches, roll with punches. Excellent fighter, Marlon Starling. DeMarco bangs the body then up to the head. DeMarco has decided he will throw punches in bunches to land. Another close round here, under 30 seconds to go. Marlon Starling on the inside. A cute combination where he holds DeMarco briefly, lands the uppercut with the right, then holds him and then hits him with the left uppercut. Nice job by Marlon Starling. Final seconds here in round two. Starling punching at the belt, chopping right hand, left hook, right hand in tight. And DeMarco has a bloody mouth. And again, you can fight through that. That lip, oof, doesn't look good, but you're going to start swallowing blood, and that will upset a pugilist's tummy. And we give round two to Marlon Starlin. He came on strong. He's a cute inside fighter, cute outside fighter. I remember watching him fight Donald Curry twice on TV. They screwed him the first time. He beat Curry the first time. Then the second time he was winning, and he started to clown too much. And he... he I. I thought it was a draw as a kid, but they gave both bouts to uh, Curry. I didn't think Curry won either one, as I just stated. I thought Starling won the first fight, and I thought the second fight was a draw. It probably was a loss, but, I mean, it, they were both losses in reality, but he clowned a little too much. 1-1, one, one, the ringside scorer has it, and so do I. SGJ Jamie has joined us at ringside here in Springfield, Massachusetts at Pynchon Park. And we have Phantom Fighter, Jeff Ray, JAA, Jim L. Hope all as well, HC0023, and Brian Patterson. Round three, scheduled for 12, vacant USBA welterweight title. Springfield, Massachusetts, Pynchon Park. And it's DeMarco boring in. As he dips and dives, gets his punches in to the body and then up to the head and then moves away side to side. DeMarco punching from a little bit of distance. He's trying to make uh, Starling, it looks like, open up so he can catch him. Starling presses forward very slowly and cautiously. And Marlon Starling fainted with the jab, went with the right hook to the body as DeMarco tried to throw. And then quickly came up with the left hand. Good job by Marlon Starling. DeMarco behind the jab, lands a grazing cross. DeMarco misses the two jabs in the right hand. No counter by Starling. Starling gets inside. DeMarco tries to tie him up. But it's Starling who quickly works the body. Beautiful body shots by Marlon Starling. A minute to go here in round three. And it's Tony DeMarco. Right hand, left hook, left hook to the head, and a right hook to the head of Marlon Starling. Marlon Starling smiles and shakes it off. Under a minute to go here in round number three. Marlon Starling lands a jab, gets inside, ties up. 20 seconds to go. Starling working inside, lands on the belt line. Final moments here in round number three. And it's Tony DeMarco winging wildly, missing as Marlon Starling rolled away from the punches. Very close round. Uh, very close round. I can't pick a winner there. SGJ Jamie at ringside in the chat says, Those fights with Curry were great. Yes, they were. Yes, they were. And I'm a bit biased because I like Marlon Starlin. I just thought Starlin won both of them. 
maybe a draw in the second. Again, in reality, Curry won both of them. We move on to round number four. We'll check the scoring after five. Round four, scheduled for 12, vacant USBA welterweight title. This is a rematch. These two pugilists fought to a draw at the Yale Bowl on the undercard of a Gene Tunney defense. And it's Tony DeMarco coming out, winging wildly and missing. Starling gets in inside. Starling banging away. So after DeMarco misses the punches, Starling gets inside, rat-a-tats the ribs, and then up to the head. Four punches land by Marlon Starling. Quick combinations. He'll try to bust De DeMarco up. DeMarco lands a jab, and then the right hand. Right hand was grazing as Starling rolls with the punches. Starling again gets inside of DeMarco. DeMarco's more of an aggressive counterpuncher at the moment. It's not like he's boxing from the outside. He's just keeping a little distance, trying to have Starling open up. But before he can throw, Starling lands a quick little one-two on the inside. Hands held high for Marlon Starling. Marlon Starling continues to work. Chopping right hand, left uppercut, and a right hook. Nails DeMarco, and DeMarco's left eye begins to swell. So he has blood from the mouth and swelling near the left eye. Good job as Marlon Starling starts to chop up Tony DeMarco. Now both fighters trying to work the angles. DeMarco gets away from Starling. Again, Starling moving in. DeMarco trying to catch. Oh, a left-right combination! He caught Marlon Starling coming in, but Starling shrugs it off. Starling has a very good chin, but it was an effective scoring combination. And if you keep landing those punches, the dam will break. Under 30 seconds to go here in round four. Starling on the inside. Left hook to the body. Right hook to the body. Left uppercut. DeMarco again, not a defensive wins. They toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange. The bell ending round four. We give that round to Marlon Starling. In actuality, let's go take a look at the ringside score. I said after five, let's go now. Even Stevens, 38-38. The ringside score has Starling and DeMarco splitting the four rounds. We're in agreement there. Round five in the Starling corner, Eddie Futch. They like what Marlon's doing. I think they want him to start opening up a bit more. But when he does that, when he opens up a bit more, Tony DeMarco has a good chance. Because now he can punch when Starling punches, and it's called last tag. Punch when your opponent punches, because that's the only way you're going to hit him. It was a strategy used by Oscar Bonavina when Gil Clancy was training him. When Bonavita fought Muhammad Ali in Ali's second comeback fight after the suspension at Madison Square Garden. And it worked. Ali did stop Bonavina in the 15th, though. But it was a sound strategy because Bonavita would never have really hit Ali. They wanted Ali to throw, and as soon as Ali threw, they conditioned Bonavina, who was a tough, tough fighter, very good fighter from Argentina, to throw immediately because that's the only way he was going to land. Round 5, scheduled for 12. There's a beautiful toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange, ring center. And again, it's Starling coming forward, starting to throw. And as he begins to throw, DeMarco throws. So both fighters land and land well. Another big toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange. The same thing. DeMarco wants Starling to lead. Yes, he'll get caught with punches, but he's able to land as both fighters landing hooks and short chopping punches. DeMarco is a bit from the outside. Starling works his way in, and this time Marlon Starling lets his hands go with a left and a right, and then the right uppercut hybrid hook to the body, and he quickly ties up DeMarco, not allowing DeMarco to punch. DeMarco works his way free, gets a little distance. DeMarco throws the cross. Starling parries it away. Starling now bangs the body and up to the head. Beautiful job by Marlon Starling. A rat-a-tat left right to the body, and a rat-a-tat left right to DeMarco's head. Again, DeMarco has swelling near the left eye and a bloody mouth. We have about a minute 20 to go here in round number five. Starling moves forward. DeMarco lands a hook to the body and shoves Starling away, working the angles. Very important by Tony DeMarco. Starling gets in, and again, he is quicker with his hands than DeMarco. He lands his two punches and ties up DeMarco, starts to walk DeMarco back. 
DeMarco works free, moves to his left. Now back to his right. Sterling catches him with a body shot, and then a right hand to the head. Good job by Marlon Sterling. 13 seconds to go here in round number five. Excellent round for Sterling. Sterling dominates at the bell. Bada bing, bada boom. Four punches get through for the man from Hartford, Connecticut. So Sterling starting to pull away and wear down Tony DeMarco. DeMarco, the pugilist from Boston, Massachusetts. Again, they fought to a 12-round draw for this title. And now they are in round... <laughs> uh, uh, they're coming up on round 18 in reality. So let's go to the scorecards. Close fight. Starling has taken 4-5. and five. He's up 48-47. We're in agreement with that. It just seems like Starling is the quicker of the two. And Starling's the much better defensive fighter. DeMarco has to punch when Starling punches, and he has to get his punches in. But Starling has a very cute style, and he sees, and again, he has the great Eddie Futch in his corner. They see what DeMarco and his people are trying to do, and they tell Marlon, get your punches off, and if you can't slide this way or that way, tie him up. Round six, scheduled for 12. Tony DeMarco now pressing in on Starling. Phone booth warfare, ring center here at Pynchon Park in Springfield, Massachusetts. And DeMarco hooks to the body with a left right. But Starling keeps his arms in tight. Marlin comes back with a chopping right hand. And then a left to the body and quickly up to the head. Good job by Marlin Starling. DeMarco, left hook to the body, right cross to the jaw, and a left hook to the jaw. Starling walks through it. But again, DeMarco landing crisply. The dam will break, they're hoping, in the DeMarco corner. Tony bangs away to the body, inside again, trying to force Starling back. But Starling's able to work the angles on the inside. But DeMarco is punching, and he is punching hard. There's the double left-right, the left to the body, and the right hook to the head. A good round so far for Tony DeMarco. 120 to go in round number six. DeMarco smothering Starling. Throwing punches in bunches. Two hooks get through. Starling comes back with a short hook on the inside. But it's DeMarco really forcing his will upon Starling. Starling lands a left and a chopping right hand. It, this is Billy Goat to Billy Goat Warfare. Final seconds and it's Tony DeMarco at the bell. Right hand, left hook. And again, Starling smiles, but that is a Tony DeMarco round. He did everything he could to win that round, and he did. They've done a fairly good job on that swelling above the left eye and around the left eye. The blood from the mouth, well, there's not too much you can do with that. So a good round for Tony DeMarco. As we're halfway through this 12-round bout for the vacant United States Boxing Association welterweight title from Pynchon Park in Springfield, Massachusetts. And after six rounds, we have it dead even, and the ringside expert scoring the bout has it dead even. But what will the three judges have it if it goes the distance? Round seven. Here's the bell. Starling will now work on the outside. They'll get DeMarco to lead a bit and try to counter. And he does! Right cross, left hook, catching DeMarco. DeMarco walks through it. Starling continues to punch as DeMarco comes for it. Two jabs and a right hand nailed Tony. Tony bringing the pressure. Bangs the body with a left and a right hook into the ribs of Marling Starling. Starling behind the jab lands the right cross. DeMarco continues to move forward looking to land punches in bunches. DeMarco wings wildly. One of those left hooks did get through to the body. Starling. From the jab, two jabs and a right hand. The right hand was grazing as DeMarco dipped underneath. Both fighters looking to work the angles. Under 30 seconds ago here in round number seven. Toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange favoring Marlon Starling. Snapping the head of Tony DeMarco. Final seconds here in round number seven. DeMarco wings wildly. Starling counters with a right hand and a left hook. The left hook was to the body, the right to the side of the head of Tony DeMarco. Marlon Starling takes round seven in our eyes. Tony DeMarco goes back to his stool. That swelling's getting slightly worse. The blood continues to come from that mouth, that cut lip. And uh, DeMarco looks tired. He has exerted a lot of effort in his attempt to win this vacant USBA welterweight title. Eddie Futch speaking very calmly to Marlon Starling in the corner. Happy with what 
the Magic Man is doing. Starlink, 67, 66. We're in agreement. Round eight. Round eight. Here's the bell. Round number eight. And it's DeMarco meeting Starling in ring center. DeMarco bangs away. Left, right to the body. Chopping right hand to the head. The left missed over the head of Marlon Starling. Starling bangs with hooks to the body. They're smothering one another. Wild combination by DeMarco. Forcing Starling back as Starling uses... His shoulders to bip and bop. A couple of punches did get through. Grazing scoring shots by DeMarco. Starling lands on the belt line. DeMarco with about a minute 30. Throws. Starling counters. Beautiful shot. Left, right. To the face of Tony DeMarco. Nice job by Marlon Starling. But DeMarco is undeterred. DeMarco digs hard to the body. Starling keeps his arms in tight. But DeMarco finds the left under. The elbow of Marlon Starling into the ribs. Under a minute to go here in round number eight. Marlon Starling, hard work on the inside. They work the angle. Starling bangs the body. Good job by Marlon Starling. Starling continues to punch. An uppercut snaps the head of DeMarco. It was a right uppercut. Then the left hook clipped him. Nice combination by Marlon Starling. Under 20 seconds to go. And look at that. At the bell, Tony DeMarco windmills four to five punches. Three of them get through, snapping the head of Marlon Starlin. Did DeMarco steal the round or was it even? Round nine, soon to be upon us. Both fighters are fatigued. And as you get tired, your defense starts to go away. Your punching power starts to go away and you get worn down. Round number nine, scheduled for 12. Vacant USBA welterweight title on the line. DeMarco now goes back to that aggressive counterpunching as Mucci, the magic man, leads. And DeMarco catches him with a left hook to the body and a grazing right hand to the head. DeMarco again catches Starlin coming in with the same combination. Left to the body, right to the head. Starlin faints. DeMarco starts to move forward. Starlin throws. DeMarco ducks underneath, and DeMarco bangs the body hard with three punches. Left, right, left. Excellent start here by Tony DeMarco here in round number nine. We're halfway through the round. DeMarco trying to work the angle. Starling gloves hell hide, trying to walk down Tony. Starling lets his hands go, faints to the head, and then lands the right to the body along with a left hook to the ribs of Tony DeMarco. Starling continues to throw. Right uppercut on the inside. And a chopping left hand to the head. Good job by Marlon Starling. Under a minute to go. This round's up for grabs. DeMarco catches Starling coming forward. Ratatatting him on the arms and ribs. Not all of them got through, but a few did score. 30 seconds to go here in round number nine. They jostle for position. Looking for an opening toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange. But DeMarco's punches were shorter and cleaner. And that might have won him the round at the end. We are through nine rounds and nothing has been decided for this vacant USBA welterweight title. They fought to a draw in the first fight. Let's see how it is in this fight. DeMarco has now pulled ahead by the ringside score and we're in agreement with that. 86-85. Another nail biter. Eddie Futch in the Marlon Starling corner wants him to get busy. In the DeMarco corner, they again go back to the aggressive counterpuncher. They want Starling to lead, and as soon as Starling does something, they want DeMarco to throw. Now, Marlon, being a smart fighter, and with Eddie Futch in his corner, they want Marlon to faint, get DeMarco to commit, and then tag Tony. Here we go, round number 10. Both fighters throw and miss. And those were punches with bad intentions. Marlon moves forward. DeMarco meets him with a lead right and a left hook to the body. They clash heads. No worse for wear. Referee warns him for the heads on the inside of both fighters. Round 10 continues. They tie up. Both fighters are very tired. Referee breaks them. And again they tie up. They've gone to wrestling tactics now. About a minute 15 left in round number 10. DeMarco 
is fainted out of position, and Marlon Sterling lands a grazing left hook to the head. DeMarco was dipping after he was fainted out of position. Marlon Sterling throws, lands a grazing shot to the body. DeMarco coming up, and DeMarco bangs hard to the body with a left-right counter. Sterling undeterred. A jab and a chopping right hand. The right hand was blocked by Tony. The jab got through. Final seconds. On the inside, Marling lands a pity pat combination. We go to round 11. Did that pity pat combination win Sterling the round? I give that round even. Round 11 and 12 still to come. Unbelievable. So far, there's two bout series. Will there be a third bout? Will it be a draw again? Round 11. Vacant USBA welterweight title on the line. Here we go. From Springfield, Massachusetts, Pynchon Park. Starlin pressing forward. DeMarco looking to counter as he moves. But Starlin is, again, he's able to feint DeMarco out of position. Digs hard to the rib cage of Tony DeMarco. Starlin continues to punch. Now he moves his attack to the head with a lead right and a hybrid left hook uppercut. Good start for Marlon Starling. DeMarco starting to fade. Starling starting to pour it on. DeMarco starting to back up. He's no longer moving side to side. DeMarco tries to stand his ground. DeMarco misses with the right but lands a grazing jab after. Marlon bangs away. Punches. Not as much starch on him, but he is banging away, snapping the head of DeMarco. DeMarco continues to back towards the ropes. Starling continues to bang the body. DeMarco now on the ropes. Starling looking to open up. He wings wildly, uncharacteristically of Marlon Starling. DeMarco counters off the ropes with the right hand. 22 seconds ago here in round 11, it's been all Marlon Sterling. He has a tired DeMarco near the ropes, and he continues to pound away, but he is not landing those shards. DeMarco dips underneath, comes up throwing, left hook on the jaw! And it didn't even cause Starling to blink. They fight at the bell, and it's Marlon Starling landing a right hand and a left hook, the right hand to the side of the head of DeMarco, the left hook to the body. The magic man smiles at Tony. Tony not thrilled with that, but that was a big round for the magic man, Marlon Starling from Hartford, Connecticut. DeMarco landed a beautiful left hook off the ropes, but it didn't phase Marlin at all. Let's go to the ringside expert scorecard. What a bout. Final three minutes. He has DeMarco up by one. I have it very, very close. I go back and forth with some of those close rounds in my head. So this fight is up for grabs here in round 12, final three minutes. Remember, I know I've stated it, but these two pugilists fought to a draw the first time they met for this vacant title when they fought on the undercard of a Gene Tunney title offense at the Yale Bowl in Connecticut. Now DeMarco gets the rematch in Massachusetts, though not at the Boston Garden, but at Pynchon Park in Springfield, Massachusetts. They touch gloves. Here it is, final three minutes. And again, the ringside scorer has DeMarco up by a point. It could go either way here. Marlon Starlin, DeMarco meet at ring center. Starling lets his hands go. Beautiful combination on the inside. Starling lands on the belt line. Starling imposing his will on DeMarco. Starling again bangs that body. DeMarco not throwing. It's been all Marlon Starling. Both fighters throw and miss. They tie up now. They break. Toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange. Even exchange. But Marlon Starling is clearly winning this round. Starling. Is get tagged with a right, left, right. Good job by Tony DeMarco. Under a minute to go. Another toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange. Fans on their feet here. Starling bangs away. Beautiful left and then the right uppercut. Final 30 seconds. DeMarco seems dazed. And DeMarco bangs low to stop the Starling. Onslaught as he was on the ropes, and there is the bell. Oh, Tony DeMarco was dangerously close to being stopped. A tired, swollen, bloody DeMarco. But he makes it to the bell. This could be another draw. Let's just quickly go to the ringside scorer. 114 114. They've now fought 24 rounds. 
of pure violence and excitement. Marlon, Starlin, and Tony DeMarco, will they do it for a third time for this vacant title? If it is again a draw. Holy cow. Again, this is unofficial. How did you see it? Phantom Fighter was going with Marlon Starlin. Now we're going to find out. We are going to find out. DeMarco, Starlin, neither fighter. You can see it. They know they fought hard. Starlin wins the final round, makes it even. Again, on the unofficial ringside score. It can go either way in my eyes. We go to the judges. Here's the announcement. 116-113 Starling. 115-114 Starling. 114-114 even. The winner by majority decision and new United States Boxing Association welterweight champion, the man from Hartford, Connecticut, the magic man, Marlon Sterling. So again, 116-113 Starling. 115-114 Starling. And 114-114 all. You can't complain with the decision unless you're in the Tony DeMarco corner, I guess. Unbelievable bout. Marlon Starlin claims the vacant USBA welterweight championship. Let's go to the judges. Let's just see. Uh, Starlin took the 10th and the 11th. DeMarco took... I'm sorry, Starlin took the 12th and the 11th, excuse me. DeMarco took the 10th on two out of three judges' scorecards. Another one had it even. There was a split in nine, but DeMarco won two out of the two out of three judges. DeMarco took the eighth. Starlin took the seventh. DeMarco took the sixth. Starlin took the fifth. Starlin took the fourth. DeMarco took the third. Starlin took the second. DeMarco took the first. Wow. Phantom Fighter had it 115, 113 Starling. Yeah, you can't. Uh, very close fight. 24 rounds, and it took all 24 rounds to decide. The vacant USBA champion. And it's Marlon Starlin, the magic man from Hartford, Connecticut. We now move on to our first of two world championship fights here at Pension Park in Springfield, Massachusetts. This one could have been fought in the Yale Bowl, but it's being fought at Pension Park. Willie Pep, the welterweight champion from Connecticut, takes on battling Batalano from Connecticut. Neither fighter is a big puncher. Pep will want to fight on the outside. Battling Battagliano wants to get inside and work and work hard. Both, in reality, were featherweight champions of the world. Willie Pep, the Wisp, 230 victories, 11 defeats, 1 draw, 65 by stoppages from Middletown, Connecticut. Had those incredible brawls with Sandy Sadler in which Sadler got the best of him. Pep only won one of those fights. Battling Battagliano, is from Hartford, Connecticut. 57, 26, and 3 with 23 stoppages. Both have tremendous endurance. Uh, Battagliano is a little fresher with the power early on. And then after round 5, he will automatically lose uh, 2 points of power. So, And he's a pressure fighter. He's going to work on the inside. That's where he needs to be. He needs to be on the inside. Where Pep can work a, a, a elusive from the outside or from the outside in general. But Pep is, uh, again, not an inside fighter, but he will land in there. He will land, and Pep can wear you down. Pep's defense is outstanding. Four out of six on a six-sided dice roll. I have not changed the eight-sided dice roll because I didn't start my universe with that, so I'm not going to do it. It's a good, it's a good uh, another rule, optional rule you can use, though. Uh, Battagliano defense, not horrific, but below average. Uh, it, it's going to be a war of wills. Can Bat, uh, Battagliano get on the inside? Can Pep keep him on the outside? Battagliano, usually Pep, again, you can see his control, 11 against physical fighters, 11 against tacticians. Well, Battagliano is a physical fighter, but Battagliano has a 10 against tacticians. So, And again, Battagliano on the inside, combinations, uppercuts. Pep wants to work the jab, right hand, and hooks from distance. The Golden Eagle 99 has joined us at ringside. Hope all is well. Also here, HC0023, SGJ, Jamie, Phantom Fighter. Check out that wonderful channel. Uh, Jeff Ray, Jim L. Hope all is well. 
J double A and Brian Patterson. So the preview is over. Our first of two world title fights. Remember, folks, stay with us here. The main event, Marvelous Marvin Hagler versus Paul Pender. Could be a tougher matchup than people think. Both pugilists are in the ring. The champion, Willie the Wisp Pep, out of Middletown, Connecticut, red corner, battling Battagliano, Hartford, Connecticut, blue corner. They have touch gloves, both immigrant sons from Italy. And now they will do battle here at the baseball park, Pynchon Park, Springfield, Massachusetts. 17,500 fans have packed this minor league baseball stadium. The bell for round number one. Pep hopes to defend his title once again. But it's Battagliano getting in on the inside. Pep going to fight him there. Battagliano throws, but Pep is able to dip and dive away. The Wisp is not touched. Battagliano holds on to the Wisp this time and bangs away with uppercuts. Good job by the battling Battagliano. Battagliano again bores in, but misses those shots. Pep is a defensive whiz. Toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange, equal exchange. About a minute 30 to go here in round number one. Battagliano forcing Pep back. Banging away, left, right to the body, and a left uppercut, snapping the head of Willie Pep. Good start for battling Battagliano. Battagliano has Pep on the ropes, and again he holds Pep in place and hits him with an uppercut. Pep looks to fight off the ropes. Good job by Willie. Double left hook, one to the body, one to the head, and the wisp slides away back to ring center. Battagliano follows, cuts the ring off, Pep stands his ground, but again, Battagliano gets on the inside, mauls him, and hits him with the uppercut. That's the tactic he needs to use over and over again. And he wings a right hand over the head of Willie the Wisp, missing at the bell. But that round goes to the man from Hartford, Connecticut, battling Battagliano. Round one to Battagliano in our eyes. Tremendous endurance for both of these fighters. Pep again looks like he's... They're telling Willie... Get your pound of flesh. They're going to have him fight on the inside. I don't know if I agree with that strategy. Battagliano welcomes it. First round went to Battagliano. Here we go. Round number two. And it's Battagliano on the inside. Banging away with a chopping right hand and a left hook to the body. He'll fight this way all day, all night. Willie comes back with a four-punch combination. Rat-a-tat to the body. Rat-a-tat to the head. The Wisp is no, not afraid. Toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange in tight by both pugilists. Willie getting into a rhythm now. Misses. Counter by Batty Liano. Right hand, left hook, right hand. And Pep. That left eye is puffing up. Oh, bad swelling. A big combination on the inside by battling Batty Liano. Again, the strategy from the Pep corner might be questioned if he somehow loses this fight. Pep comes right back. He throws a jab and a right hand. And Batty Liano... Has blood from the nose. Holy cow, they're going at it. Pep continues to punch. Left, right, left to the head of Battagliano. Battagliano giving ground. I'm under a minute to go here in round number two. Pep is punching. Pep misses the left hook to the head, but lands the right hook to the body. He's standing in tight with battling Battagliano. Toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange, even exchange. Pep has really come on since that, that combination that has swelled up his left eye. Pep continues, two jabs and a right hand, and there's the bell. So Willie Pep got woke up by that big combination by battling Battagliano. Willie Pep takes that round, but they'll work on the swelling in the Pep corner. In the battling Battagliano corner, they're telling him, more pressure, more pressure, more pressure. Hold him and hit him. Do whatever you got. Step on his foot. Willie the Wisp's going to fight on the inside. Again, that was the mistake he made against Sandy Sadler in the majority of their bouts. Fighting on the inside with the tough, rugged man from Boston, Massachusetts, Sandy Sadler. One round apiece. Round three. There's the bell. Badaliano gets inside. Pep, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, ring center. Badaliano holds him, pounds away with the right uppercut, snapping Pep's head. Pep looks to come back. Pep lands a quick little one-two. Grazing shots on the inside. Battagliano 
bangs away with the combination to the body, and then he puts that forearm into the face of Pep. This fight is getting quite dirty. Toe to toe exchange miss. They maul, they brawl again. They look to find those angles to bang away at punches. It's Pep who finds the angle, and a quick one, two, three to the head of Badaliano. Pep again throws and misses. Badaliano smothers him. Badaliano works his hands free. And he holds Pep in the back of the head and jams that right uppercut into the face of Willie Pep. The strategy by Pep in his corner is a little questioning to me. Toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange and Badaliano got the better of it. Pep gives ground. Final moments here in round three. Pep looks to fire back and he does with a combination. I give that round to Badaliano. He landed a big combination. I have a 2-1 for battling Badaliano. Say that 22 times fast. The ringside scorer has it 2-1. Phantom Fighter says explosive second round. It sure was. Pep came right back, though. Round number four. Featherweight Championship of the World at stake here. Between two Italian-Americans, Willie the Wisp Pep and Battling Badaliano, both from the great state of Connecticut. The bell for round number four. Pep now decides to work from the outside. Beautiful combination, a jab and a right hand as Badaliano chases Pep around the ring. Pep will not stand still. As Badaliano continues to chase, Pep goes back and forth like the wind. You can't hit the wind. Badaliano throws, grazing punches land. Pep counters with a left right to the body. Nice job by Willie the Wisp. Willie working behind the jab. Two more jabs looking to frustrate Badaliano. Badaliano pressing, pressing, pressing. And Badaliano is able to hold Willie Pep with his right hand and arm and bang away with the left to the body. Badaliano again holds Willie and hits him with the right uppercut. Badaliano pressing Willie Pep back. And again forcing Pep into the ropes, holding and hitting. If the ref lets him do it, he's going to do it. Continue to rip the uppercut, snapping the head. Of Willie Pep. Pep looks to fight off the ropes. And he does. A three-punch salvo at the bell. Snapping Badaliano's head. Left, right, left. Quick punches. And the wisp is gone. Pep takes the round with that combination at the end. Badaliano was still able to rough up Pep. In the Pep corner, they have gone away from that... Uh, uh, test strategy of fighting on the inside. They want Willie on the outside now. Let's see if Willie can keep battling Badaliano at bay. Let's check the scorecards after four. Ringside score gave round four even. So Badaliano still up unofficially by one point. I gave it to Pep. Round five scheduled for 15. World Championship. Featherweight. The bell. Willie Pep. Beautiful job. He fainted with the jab and lands the right hook to the body and then comes back with a left jab. Nice job by Willie. Willie the Wisp, two jabs and a right hand. Badaliano has a bad cut near the right eye. That will change the tide of battle. That's a lot of blood near the right eye. Willie Pep looks to open up now. He throws hard and misses. Badaliano counters with a right hand. Pep. Standing his ground a little more. Badaliano holds him. That's a lot of blood. Hits him with the uppercut. Badaliano again holding and hitting. He grabs Willie Pep. Works his hands freeze. And throws windmilling punches. Grazing shots but scoring shots. Willie Pep now gets distance. Badaliano fainted out of position. Nailed with two jabs by Pep. Pep goes low. Pep can get dirty when he wants. Under a minute to go. In round number five, Willie Pep faints with the jab, lands the right hook to the body. A bloody Badaliano trying to cut the ring off on Pep. Toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange, and there is the bell. Grazing shots by both pugilists. They quickly get Badaliano on the stool and work on that very bad cut near the right eye. The doctor's coming over to take a look. They're going to let it go. They're going to let it go. The Golden Eagle 99 says, I've heard of Willie Pep, never heard of Badaliano. He fought in the early, I looked it up and now I forgot the time, but it's, it's, I want to say it's in the 20s, and I could, it could even be before that. 
Here we go, round six, but the concern is that horrific cut near the right eye, and that blood is getting into the eye of Battling Battleiana. 48-48, the ringside score has it. Here we go, round number six. Badliano trying to get inside. Pep will stay outside and peck away at that cut. And there it is. There it is. He faints with that jab. Badliano quickly tries to bring his guard up. And Pep drives the right hook into the ribs of his opponent. Nice job by Willie Pep. Willie Pep. Two jabs and a right hand. And that is it. As Pep starts to windmill, Badliano cannot defend himself. And the referee has leaped in to stop the bout here in round six. Early in round six. Willie Pep has retained his featherweight championship here in Springfield, Massachusetts at Pynchon Park. Willie Pep busted up Badliano and then went for it. And as soon as Badliano got caught, you could see the blood start to flow and flow like the Nile River. Willie Pep started punching away, Badliano backing away, not defending himself, being hit over and over again until the referee leapt in to... Stop the bout and halt the slaughter. So Willie Pep retains his featherweight championship via TKO 38 seconds into round number six. An excellent effort by Willie Pep. Again, the ringside scorer had it close, but when, when that cut happened, you knew it was over. You knew it was over. Willie Pep. And again, Pep had that odd odd strategy early on of fighting on the inside and that's where Badliano had an opportunity. I give a lot of credit to the man from Hartford, Connecticut battling Badliano. He did his best. He brought the fight on the inside. He held on to Pep, stepped on his foot, punched on the inside, held and hit, shoved Pep, roughed him up in those two rounds and finally in the Pep corner they, they smartened up. They said, come on Willie, let's work from the outside. Pick this kid apart. And they did. Let's go to the report. Wow, before the stoppage, 48-48, 48-48, 48-48, 48-48. the fans have seen quite an excellent fight card here from Pynchon Park in Springfield, Massachusetts. John Wise says, my dad grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts. My mom grew up in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Well, John, there was a cathedral football coach who had your last name and your first name. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. And Mark Belanger, who played shortstop for the Orioles, for it was from Pittsfield, Massachusetts. So it was an even fight at the stoppage on the three judges' scorecards. So Willie Pep retains his title. We now go to the main event. This will be for the middleweight championship of the world. Marvelous Marvin Hagler, Paul Pender. But before we go to that, let's go through this 11, the 10 prior fights. Seven of them were not televised or, and also there was no radio broadcast. So let's go through them if you're just joining us. Eric Butterbeanesh and Jose Roman fought to a draw. Both fighters dropping one another. Roman dropping Esch in the final seconds of the bout. And that's what got him the draw. John Dino Dennis crushed Peter McNeely. Both men from Massachusetts. Peter McNeely is horrible. As he loses once again, John Dino Dennis, well, his claim to fame was he gave uh, George Foreman a tough tussle. Uh, but he, he got stopped. And he also lost to Joe Bugner and Jerry Cooney. Marvis Frazier won a hard-fought majority points win over Lorenzo Zanone of Italy. And those were our three fights. The first three fights were heavyweight bouts. Got the crowd revved up. Then we went bantamweights. Lou Salika by unanimous close decision over Sung Kil Moon of South Korea. Duku Kim of South Korea coming in as an opponent for Vinny Pazienza. Pazienza from Providence, Rhode Island, not far from Springfield, Massachusetts, was upset as Duku Kim, when Pazienza played, Duku Kim punched. And he won a majority points decision. Donnie Lalonde stopped M M uh, Emilio Bettina. Bettina from Connecticut. He was stopped, battered, bloodied in the fourth round. Jack Sharkey from Boston, Massachusetts. Defeated Peter McNeely's dad via TKO in the third. Tom McNeely. In our first title bout for the USBA Junior Welterweight Championship. Gene Hatcher 
and Mickey Ward fought a dirty, bloody war that saw Gene Hatcher going to stop Mickey Ward. Mickey Ward was DQ'd for too many low blows, and they went at it. There was a mini riot in the ring, uh, and Hatcher and the referee and Hatcher's corner people had to be escorted via the police to the back and get them the hell out of the stadium as fans were hurling things at them. As Mickey Ward is from Lowell, Massachusetts. Marlon Starling and Tony DeMarco, they had fought for a draw the first time for the vacant USBA title. And boy, it was another good one. Marlon Starling would claim the vacant USBA welterweight title by majority points decision over DeMarco. And as we just witnessed, Willie Pep stops battling Bat uh, Batliano, both pugilists from Connecticut, but there can only be one winner, and it was the world champion, Willie Pep, as he stopped Batliano on cuts, battering him into submission on the ropes. Referee stepped in 38 seconds into round six. So the main event, 15 rounds, middleweight championship of the world. Marvelous Marvin Hagler versus Paul Pender. Let's go to the preview. Marvelous Marvin Hagler fighting out of Brockton, Massachusetts. Paul Pender fighting out of Brookline, Massachusetts. Both men were world champions, though Hagler, the much better of the two. Jamel says, Al, do you have all the weight classes of boxers and legends of boxing? Yes, I do. <laughs> because I love my boxing games. I enjoy them so much. I love this game. I love title about PC2, and I love Glory Days Boxing. Jamel says, he has heavyweights, middleweights, and welterweights. Yeah, I mean, get the ones you're going to play. I mean, if you're all just into heavyweights, just get the heavyweights. I like this game. I like it. You can also roll your own dice. I did a video on that. It takes a little longer, but if you want to roll your own dice and input it, you can do that too. Fun games. Might as well have fun, right? So Hagler, 63-3-2 uh, with 52 stoppages. Hagler lost to Watts, Willie the Worm, Monroe, and, and Leonard. He would avenge two out of those three losses with Watts and Monroe. He had a draw with the Antifermo. I don't know who he had the other draw with. I don't know who he had the other draw with. I can't remember that. Paul Pender, I believe... Uh, actually, Paul Pender did beat, I'm positive, beat Sugar Ray Robinson. That was at the end of Robinson. I mean, wait, Robinson was old. But Pender beat him. And I think he beat Gene Ful an old Gene Fulmer, too. He was 46-2 and two with 20 stoppages. Uh, Hagler will have the edge in endurance. Hagler's a southpaw. He'll switch to orthodox. Hagler has the advantage in power. Pender a slight edge. Pender a very good defensive fighter. Uh, on a six-sided die roll, it's a three. So it's a 50-50 shot that he'll do something defensively. Um, Hagler, again, it's, it's marvelous Marvin Hagler. He can switch up. He likes to hook, throw crosses. He also throws combinations. Pender is going to go jab, right cross, and combinations. Pender wants to fight on the inside. I'm, I'm sorry, Pender wants to fight on the outside, excuse me. Does not like to fight on the inside or give pressure. Hagler's Hagler. He can do it all. SGJ Jamie says, I buy a division or two a month uh, down from heavyweight to lightweight. Yeah, that's all you have to do. Enjoy your games, you know. This is a well-developed game. And I love that I can put my own pictures in the game. And my new thing is if you look at the Paul Pender picture, what I do is I find an action shot, stretch it out to a certain level, and then I get a... Uh, not a... Uh, not a yearbook photo necessarily, but similar to that, and I put it in the corner. And Hagler, I'd already put his photo in. I'm not going to go back. I might, I might go back and put the other photos in later. You know, like redo them. But I like that. You can also create fighters. I made Joe Baxke. Uh, I might make Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder. What I do is when I make a fighter, I test them. I tested Baxke in my in my universe, but with the new fighters I'm going to make. I'm going to test them in a, a different kind of universe and then tweak it and then bring them into this universe to try to get them as good as possible. Accurate. Again, it's a game, so. All right. Fighters are here in the ring. We are at Pynchon Park in Springfield, Massachusetts. Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Uh, drew with Munzone for the vacant title. Beat Munzone. Uh, he had beat 
Frank the Animal Fletcher prior to his title shot. And in his last defense, he stopped Rocky Graziano, who was the number one ranked contender. Yes, I think Graziano was the number one ranked contender. RJL Networks join us, our good friend Rob. Check out that wonderful channel. As RJL is not a fan of Hagler. He says he was a showboater. I don't think Hagler was a showboater. Sugar Ray Leonard was a showboater. But to each is their own. At ringside, we have RJL Network, HC0023, SGJ Jamie, Jim L, Hope All is Well, John Wise, The Golden Eagle 99, Phantom Fighter, check out his wonderful channel. Double JAA, Jeff Ray. Hey, I like that. JAA, Jeff Ray. That's a good ring. Separate people, but good ring. And Brian Patterson. All right, here we go. This is it, the main event, 15 rounds, middleweight championship of the world. Both men from Massachusetts. The favorite, the betting favorite, if marvelous Marvin Hagler. They touch gloves. Here's the bell for round number one, scheduled for 15. The world title at stake. Pender comes out, and Pender lands a nice jab and a right hand. A good one-two by Paul Pender as he catches... Hagler, Hagler in that southpaw stance. Zalapski Smurf has joined us at ringside. How you doing? Pender again works off that jab and hooks to the body. Good start for Paul Pender, the pugilist from Brookline, Massachusetts. Pender faints. Hagler tries to move in. Pender moves away. Hagler now out of the southpaw stance. Right jab, left hook to the jaw. Pender... Took those shots well. Pender comes back. Lands a quick three-punch combination. Left jab, right hand, and a left hook upon the cranium of the bald one. Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Hagler undeterred. Right jab, left cross, and then a right hook to the body. Pender comes back. Good action here in round one. Snapping the head of Hagler as Hagler tried to dart in. A good round for Paul Pender. Hagler undeterred. Bangs a lead left cross and a right hook to the body. Final moments in a very competitive round one. And it's Paul Pender doing the punching. And Paul Pender actually on the inside. Bangs hooks to the body at the bell. Good job by Paul Pender. We give Paul Pender the underdog the round. The Petronellis are in the Hagler corner. And they want him to go after Pender. They said Pender will wilt. Cutter Historical has joined us at ringside. As he says, I managed to get out to get to Mass via the snowy north of Ontario. As he is hoping for a Canadian card on April 9th of this year. I believe that's his birthday. Happy early birthday to you. I will try to do that. It might not be in this game, though. Or we might use a couple of different games so we can get... As many of the better Canadian... Ah, we got enough Canadian fighters. In there. We could do it. We could do it. Or maybe Glory Days Boxing. I'm going to have some Glory Days Boxing coming up. Some fights that would have been interesting if they happened in the day. And they could have. We're looking at Marvis Frazier against uh, Harry Kotsia. And we're looking at Jerry Cooney, Mike Weaver. Both title fights that never happened. The Weaver-Cooney fight was actually signed to happen. And I want, I want to say Cooney got hurt. And this was prior to Cooney fighting uh, Larry Holmes. Round two, scheduled for 15. We gave Pender round one. And here comes Marvin Hagler pressing Pender. And Hagler bangs away. But Pender, an excellent defensive fighter. Hagler with a grazing uppercut. Pender ties up Hagler. He doesn't want Hagler to fight on the inside. Pender gets back to distance. And he feints with the jab and lands a right hook to the body and comes back to a jab to the head. Pender again under control. Same combination. Fainted with the jab. Comes with a right to the labanza of a pressing Hagler. And then snaps the jab into Hagler's face, stopping any type of counter. Pender again in a rhythm. Same combination. He is catching Hagler moving forward. Toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange, even exchange. Pender doing quite well. So far, early in this fight, under a minute to go, Hagler works his way in, bangs a grazing combination to the body, Pender slides away. Pender, an excellent defender. Toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange, favoring Pender. 
Hagler looks a bit frustrated. Final seconds here in round two. They tie up. Pender holding on for dear life as an angry, marvelous Marvin Hagler wants to punch. Two rounds in the books. Two rounds for Marv. Uh, excuse me, for Paul Pender, in our opinion. Pender boxing beautifully, landing from distance, tying up Hagler on the inside. Let's go to the ringside score. He's given both rounds to Pender as we have. The Petronellis in the Hagler corner are telling Hagler just to stay calm, stay calm, start working the body. Just put some punches on him and everything will flow. Round three scheduled for 15. Middleweight championship at stake of the world. Hagler looks to get Pender out of position. Hagler throws, but Pender is not touched. Pender fighting a beautiful fight so far. Hagler again throws and misses. Pender just keeping Hagler at bay with footwork, pawing the jab out there. Hagler lands the right jab. Again, he's a southpaw. Hagler again looks to throw. Faints with the right jab. Lands a left hook to the body. Pender looking to come back. Pender lands a right hook to the body and then quickly comes up to the head with that jab. Stopping any type of Hagler counter. Pender misses the right hand. No counter by Hagler. Hagler hooks to the body. Left, right. Both fighters on their toe. Paul Pender misses the left and the right. Hagler comes with the counter. Right hand, left hook, right hand. And Pender is hurt. Pender is hurt. Pender goes into the ropes. He is in bad shape. Hagler looks for the kill. Hagler opens up at the bell. Oh, my Lord. The bell saves Paul Pender as marvelous Marvin Hagler was going to work on what seemed to be a defenseless Paul Pender who gingerly goes back to his stool They'll try to revive Pender in between rounds as Marvin Hagler took out all of his frustrations from the first two rounds in that final 40 seconds of round three. Could this be the end of Paul Pender, the pugilist from Brookline, Massachusetts? Holy cow! A huge round for Hagler. Let's see if he takes out Pender in the fourth. 2-1 Pender but Hagler looks to be ready to steamroll Paul Pender. Pender not much of a puncher at all. Here's the bell round four. Pender staying on the outside. Hagler on the outside but he's looking to bait Pender in. Hagler throws and misses. Hagler missed with the left cross and the right hook to the body. Pender behind the jab. Lands a solid combination. Not much on those punches, but they're scoring blows. Pender again comes back with a lead right cross and left hook. Then slides away. Pender's got to keep this at distance. Pender working well off the jab. Now he misses those shots. He is frustrating Hagler. Hagler unable to punch. Hagler tries to work in punching range. And he comes back with grazing shots. Two jabs. Under a minute to go here in round number four. It's Hagler throwing and missing. Pen Pender with a right cross counter. Nice job by Paul Pender. Hagler grazing left cross. Right hook missed to the body. Hagler again punching. Beautiful three punch combination snapping the head of Paul Pender. Right, left, right. And there's the bell. Pender blinking, but there's no blood. So after being pummeled in round three, the final 40 seconds found Pender fighting for his life on the ropes. Pender came back pretty well. Very tight round in round four. Hagler is settled in now. Now will he methodically go to work to stop Paul Pender who's trying to take this championship away from the Marvelous One. Round five, the bell. And here's Paul Pender. Beautiful job. Again, a nice jab and then the right hand. And then the jab on the way out to keep Hagler off balance. They clash heads. No worse for the wear. That's lucky for both pugilists. Toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange. Again, both fighters from distance. They circle one another. It was an even exchange. Hagler faints with the jab. 
and lands a left hook to the body. Again, Hagler is southpaw. He hasn't switched up yet. Hagler again feints with the jab and lands a left hook to the body. Hagler in a rhythm. Misses those jabs. Good defense by Paul Pender. Hagler throws hooks. Pender moves away. Hagler again throws. Jab and then the right hook to the body. Left hook to the body, excuse me. Hagler's not switched up yet. Hagler throws, misses, lands a grazing left hand. Pen Pender counters with a left to the body and quickly brings the left hook up to the head. Another close round, though we give that to Hagler. We are through five rounds. Let's go to the scorecards. After five rounds, the ringside scorer has it even, 48-48, giving round four a 10-10 round. Pender took the first two rounds. Hagler took three and five. We see it very close. Tony Martin has joined us. How are you doing? Will you have Muhammad Ali fighting for the title? Muhammad Ali has not yet had a title shot. Gene Tunney holds our heavyweight championship. Ali did win his first fight. Uh, it was Max Schmeling he beat. Is it Schmeling? No. No, no. Larry Holmes beat Max Schmeling. Who did Ali beat? Ali beat somebody. He struggled a little bit, and then he won. Oh, he beat Taylor Philo Stevenson. Competitive for a little bit, then he ran away with it. Here we go. Round six, scheduled for 15. Hope you're doing well, Tony Martin. Hagler in control. Hagler switched it up now. He's orthodox. And boy, did that fool Paul Pender. He switched it up, nailed Pender with a lead right, left hook, and another right hand, and Pender is down. Hagler switched it up. Catching Pender. Pender gets up at the count of three. He'll take the mandatory eight. Hagler looks to pounce on his prey. Pender in a world of hurt. Hagler tries to follow up. Pender running on his bicycle. Hagler again throws. Pender on the move. Pender looks to throw the jab. He feints the jab and lands a right hook to the body. Hagler comes roaring back. Banging the body and up to the head. But it's Pender on the move. Oh, he's on the move. Hagler trying to cut off the ring. Lands a lead right. Misses with the left hook. Hagler fighting orthodox and he's been able to land. And again the lead right lands and the left hook misses. They're screaming from the corner for Hagler to work the body. And there it is. Left hook of the body. Right hand to the head. Left hook to the head. Pender is hurt. Pender goes back into the ropes. Seconds left here in round six. And Hagler ratatats Pender on the ropes. Nothing clean, but there were scoring blows. A huge round for marvelous Marvin Hagler. So when Hagler went orthodox, it caught Pender off guard. And Pender found himself on the canvas, quickly got up at the count of three, and took the mandatory eight. We're through six rounds. 58-56, Hagler, 10-8 round due to the knockdown. We're in agreement with that. Pender, again, not a lot of punching power. In the Pender corner, they want him to box, box, box. Hagler looks to stay orthodox. Here's the bell. Pender misses the jab in the right hand. Hagler lands the counter right. Good job by Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Now sticking with the orthodox stance. Hagler again lands a lead right. Hagler's found something here. And again, Hagler lands a lead right and puts a left into the ribs of Pender. Hagler missed the left right there. Pender did not counter, though. Good defense by Pender. Pender missed the hook. Ooh, Hagler. The referee warns him. Thought that shot was a bit low. We have under a minute to go here on round number seven. Hagler hooks to the body, left, right. Grazing shots, but scoring shots. Hagler concentrating on the body. Now goes up to the head with a jab and a right hand. Hagler staying orthodox. Final seconds here in round seven. And Hagler faints the jab, lands the right cross, then the left hook and another right cross, and the bell. Another good round for marvelous Marvin Hagler. Paul Pender... Paul Pender had his moments early. Hagler, once Hagler switched to orthodox, it has been total nightmare for Paul Pender. 
Both fighters look to work from the outside. Hagler stays orthodox. Hagler uses the jab. Jab was grazing, but the right cross landed. Pender did roll with the punch, but the punch did land. Toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange, even exchange for both fighters. Pender has to get that jab working. Pender feints the jab, lands a right hook to the body. Both fighters faint, fire, and miss. Paul Pender. The jab missed, but the right cross didn't. Hagler stays orthodox. Hagler! Left to the body, right hand to the jaw, and then a left right to the jaw. Pender is buckles. Pender goes back to the ropes. Hagler looking to land. Hagler lands a lead right, missed with a wild left. Pender, belt line with that shot. Final seconds here. Pender trying to fight off the ropes. As he bangs a left right to the body, and there's the bell. But Hagler had Paul Pender on the ropes once again. Another round for Marvin Hagler. Pender did land his fair share of blows, but Hagler landing the harder blows. We are through eight. Scheduled 15 round middleweight championship fight. Pynchon Park, Springfield, Massachusetts. Let's go to the ringside score. Unofficial. Hagler 78 74. We're in agreement. Round nine. In the Paul Pender corner, the man from Brookline, Massachusetts, he's got a punch, punch, punch. He has nothing that can stop Hagler in his fist, but he has to box, box, box. Hagler has really warmed up since those first two rounds that went to Pender. Round four was close. He dropped Pender in round six. And you can see Hagler just wearing down Pender. The bell for round nine. Both fighters from the outside. Pender a bit more elusive. Both fighters looking for an opening. Both fighters again. Jostle, move, miss. A slow-paced round nine so far. Maybe they're both trying to catch their breath. Here's Pender. Two jabs, two scoring jabs. No right hand to follow. Hagler comes right back with a jab of his own. It's a jab contest at the moment. Pender misses the left, right. No counter by Hagler. Hagler, again, fighting orthodox. That's when the bout changed. Hagler lands the right, misses the left hook. Pender comes back with a lead right and a left to the body. The right hand was to the jaw of Marvin Hagler, but there is no power behind those punches. Hagler hooks to the body, missed the right to the head. Pender at the bell, fighting on the inside, lands to the belt line. Close round. That round could have went either way. 10-10 even. I can see that too. So nine rounds complete. The ringside score and myself are in agreement. 88-84 for marvelous Marvin Hagler. Again, our scorecard's unofficial. Pender starting to breathe heavily in his corner. Petronelli's very happy with Hagler. They're sensing victory and victory soon. The bell for round 10. Pender trying to work behind that jab. He feints the jab, lands the hook to the body, comes back with a quick jab to the head, trying to keep Hagler off balance. Hagler sticks with his orthodox stance, feints, fires a left hook to the body, then the right hook to the body. Good job by Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Both fighters looking for an opening. It's Hagler who's going to throw. Lead right, clips Pender, but Pender moves away. Hagler looking to land combinations. They cannot. Pender tries to work behind the jab. He misses the jab, but lands a cross to the side of the head of Hagler. We have under a minute to go, and it's Marvelous Marvin Hagler banging to the body with a left and right. Pender again tries to establish the jab. He misses the right hand. Hagler counters with a double left hook, one to the ribs and one to the head. Pender stayed around a little too long. Pender looks to come back, lands a lead cross, but missed the left uppercut. Ten rounds in the books. A competitive fight. These last two rounds have been close. If Paul Pender pulls out those two rounds we have a close fight the ringside scorer gave it to pender i'll go in agreement 97 94 marvin hagler pender did go down but he has fought valiantly the problem is he has no power at all nothing to stop marvin hagler will hagler go southpaw again that's where pender had him he handled the southpaw stance when hagler switched to orthodox this is when the bout changed Hagler takes a swig of water. Pender takes a swig of water. I take a swig of water. Round 11. Scheduled for 15. 
Both fighters looking for an opening. Both fighters working behind the jab. Both fighters orthodox. They continue to faint, but don't fire. Hagler! Hagler might have landed low. And then in the tie-up, before the referee came in, he landed behind the head. Referee warns him. Hagler doesn't care. Hagler, two jabs, miss with the right hand. Uh, Hagler stays orthodox. Hagler faints a jab, hooks to the body, right, left. Pender looking to come back. Paul Pender lands two jabs, but he doesn't throw the right hand. Hagler, jab, right hand, left hook. Hagler chopping down Pender, but Pender is standing in there. Pender lets his hands go. Four punches flying, one to the body, three to the head. And Hagler has a cut near the left eye. Paul Pender draws blood from Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Final seconds here. Pender, Pender, with a bit of an opportunity, he windmills again. Throws a salvo, a couple of punches get through grazingly, but Pender, boy, that cut has given him confidence. Paul Pender, holy cow. I give Pender that round. They'll quickly go to work on that cut to the side of the eye of Marvelous Marvin Hagler, left side. Petronelli's want Hagler let his hands go. Dwayne Martz has joined us. Hope all is well. This fight has just gotten really close. I'm in agreement with this. 106-104. Hagler up by two. We have rounds 12, 13, 14, and 15 coming up. Pender's defense and boxing ability has kept him in this fight. Round 12. Hagler takes control, and just as I say that, Hagler faints the jab to the body and comes up to the top with a right hand, crashing Pender, and Pender goes down! Hagler to the neutral corner, Pender trying to get up, the counts reach five, six, seven, eight, Pender just beats the count, he seems dazed, referee wipes his gloves, asks if he wants to go on, he says yes, Hagler looking to end it here in round 12, Hagler rat -a a defenseless. Pender on the ropes, banging away, banging away. Pender being destroyed on the ropes. Hagler banging away. Pender needs to get off the ropes. Pender being assaulted. Holy cow, Pender taking a beating as Hagler digs to the body and up to the head. Pender looks to fight off the ropes. He misses that combination. Under 30 seconds to go here in round 12. Pender's touched the canvas for a second time. Pender lands a left right, but he's still on the ropes. Final seconds here in round 12. And the bell. Pender holding on for dear life. Wow. There's no quitting Paul Pender. But he is being battered now. As the Golden Eagle 99 says, Hagler better take Pender seriously. He took him seriously in that round. Pender has fought well. He's been down twice. As we just witnessed, round 12. And again, the first time was round 6. So, 6 and 12. Uh, unlucky rounds for Paul Pender. Hagler up 116-112. Round 13. The hard luck round. And it's Marvin Hagler out of the orthodox stance. He gave up the southpaw stance in round three. And Hagler bangs the body with a left right and then up to the head with a left right. Hagler looking to take out Paul Pender. Hagler throwing a bit wild. He misses. Pender looks for the counter. Pender lands a beautiful counter right. And then a left hook to the jaw of Marvin Hagler. No starch on those punches. Though. But Pender continues to punch. Holds Hagler in place and hits him with an uppercut. Pender pressing the fight. Hagler comes back with a hook to the body. Pender on the inside. Pender chopping away with a right hand and a left hook to the body. Pender again, fighting in tight. Ratatatting Hagler with a three-punch combination. Hagler looks to fight back. And Hagler comes back with a combination right-left. Hagler, left hook to the body, right hand to the jaw, left hook to the jaw. And Pender is down for a third time. Hagler goes to the neutral corner. Pender struggling. He starts to rise. He'll take the mandatory eight. He got up around five or six. Third time he has touched the canvas. He is in a world of hurt. He's at ring center. Hagler looks to wipe him out. Hagler, bada bing, bada boom, bada bing, bada boom, bada bing. And the bell sound saves Paul Pender. Holy cow. Paul Pender somehow stood up to that all out 
Assault by Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Ring center. No legs left under him. Hagler staring and sneering at Pender as Pender goes gingerly on spaghetti legs back to his corner. Pender down for a third time. I don't know how he stayed up after a very methodical, brutal assault in the final moments of round 13. Indeed, it was the hard luck round for Paul Pender. The referee is going over with the doctor in the Pender corner. And that is it! They have stopped the fight in the corner. Paul Pender and his corner are disputing the decision. They are protesting the stoppage, but the referee and doctor have seen enough. Paul Pender will not come out for round 14. Marvelous Marvin Hagler wins via TKO. Pender gave it his all, but his all was not enough. Marvin Hagler in quite a plucky fight. A Pender gave him a tough tussle. I thought this was going to be a good fight when we set it up. When I go through to make these fight cards, uh, whether I'm streaming them or not, I want to see if it's going to be a good fight. That's the point of me doing these things. And it was. And Hagler retains the title via stoppage. As the referee, on the advice of the ringside physician, stopped the bout at the conclusion of of round 13, not allowing Paul Pender to come out for the 14th round. Let's go to the ringside score. 126-120. Pender went down in the 13th. Pender went down in the 12th. Pender went down in the 6th. Hagler lost the first two rounds to Paul Pender. Hagler was fighting southpaw. He switched it up in round 3 to orthodox and fought orthodox the rest of the fight. Pender had a rally in rounds 9, 10, and 11. I actually might have given round 9 to Pender. But I can't remember. But they gave it even. Then Pender won 10 and 11. Then Hagler came on like a madman. Dropping Pender in the 12th, the 13th, and then the stoppage when they won't let him come out for the 14th. Probably the right decision. Pender was on the way of really getting hurt. I'm well, glad, glad you enjoyed it, Dwayne Martz. I think I said Dave Martz the first time. I apologize. As it looks like you're a NASCAR fan. SHC0023. Good fight. Pender gave Marvin a battle before going down. Yeah, it was a fun fight. Why I thought it was going to be a good fight, I'm just going to tell you. Hagler against a tactician is an 8. Pender against a physical fighter is a 6. That's not that big of a difference. Had Pender had any bit of a punch, it would have been even closer. Hagler still would have been favored. Uh, let's go to the judges. Well, they didn't have it as close as we did. 127-119, 128-120, 127-119. All for Marvin Hagler. I saw it closer than that. Dwayne Martz comes alive in the championship rounds. He sure did, Marvelous Marvin Hagler. So there you have it. Our fight card from Pynchon Park, Springfield, Massachusetts. It's done. 11 fights. Four of them. Uh, broadcasted. We'll go over them real quick and then we'll take a look at the middleweight standings and some heavyweight standings. Eric Butterbean-Esch fought to a draw with Jose Roman. Both fighters went down. Esch dropped Roman early. Roman, who has no punching power, caught Esch coming in in the final moments around 10 and that cost Esch the victory. John Dino Dennis stopped Peter McNeely in one round, both men from Massachusetts. Peter McNeely loses again. John Dino Dennis wins for the first time in our universe. Marvis Frazier, tough win over the Italian Lorenzo Zanone. Majority points win, making Papa Joe proud. Bantamweights then. Lou Salica out of New York. Tough unanimous decision over Sung Kil Moon of South Korea. 96-95, 96-94, 96-94. Then, Dooku Kim of South Korea upset the favorite from New England, from Providence, Rhode Island, Vinny Pazienza. While Pazienza played to the crowd, Dooku Kim kept punching, and he won a majority decision, 96-95, 98-93, and 95-95. My scorecard had it 97-94 in favor of Kim. 
Donnie Lalonde TKO'd Milio Bettina from Connecticut, uh, battering Bettina into a bloody pulp. They stopped the bout in the fourth. Jack Sharkey stopped Peter McNeely's dad, Tom McNeely, in the third. And so Jack Sharkey wins in his debut. Um, then we had our first title fight. Gene Hatcher won via DQ over Mickey Ward. And Mickey Ward was on the verge of being stopped. And he hit Gene Hatcher one too many times in the Franks and Beans in the bout. And he got DQ'd. That was a dirty hell of a fight, though. Marlon Starlin and Tony DeMarco clashed once again for the vacant title of the USBA welter, uh, the, for the USBA welterweight championship. They fought to a draw the first time, and Starling won a close decision to take the vacant title via majority points, 116-113, 115-114, and the third judge had it even, 114-114. Willie Pep, in quite a tussle uh, with battling Battliano, stopped Battliano in the sixth. Uh, uh, Battliano gave it his tough, uh, a tough tussle to Pep. Uh, Pep oddly fought on the inside the first two rounds. That gave Battling Battliano a good opportunity, but Pep cut Battliano in the fifth and then battered the bejesus out of him in the sixth, and they stopped the bout. And as we just witnessed, Marvin Hagler stops Paul Pender, dropping Pender three times. Pender wanted to answer the bell in the 14th, but the ringside physician and the referee would not allow it. The fight was stopped. Hagler retains his middleweight championship. Dwayne Martz, Al, have you fought any featherweight fights with Danny Little Red Lopez? No, not yet. Let's look at the featherweights real real quick for our good friend Dwayne Martz. First time I've seen Dwayne in the chat. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed the stream, please hit the like button. If you haven't subscribed and you want to, please do so. If you do subscribe, hit the bell for notification. We'd like to have you back. We have a lot of fun with these things. We do a lot of sports, and we do chats with Al and stuff like that. Uh, let's go featherweights. So let's go to rankings. Let's go featherweights for Dwayne Martz. Pep is a champion. Uh, again, don't look at these ratings because they mean nothing. Because a lot of these guys haven't fought yet. Uh, Danny Little Red Lopez, we have not fought yet. Tremendous action fighter, former champion. I try to do fights that don't actually take pl didn't actually take place because we know what really happened. So maybe we go Danny Little Red Lopez Jeff Fennick. That would be an action fight. Eight eight nine eight. Oh yeah, that's gonna be a good fight. I think that we could do Jeff Fennick, Danny Little Red Lopez. We get him on a fight card. How about that? As Tony Martin says, Sugar Ray Robinson wants Hagler. We have not fought Robinson yet. I try to get other fighters. I mean, again, you could just fight all the great. They're all good fighters in these sets, the majority of them. So let's look at the middleweights real, real quick. And then the heavyweights and welterweights and so on and so forth. <clears throat> middleweights. Hagler's a champ. Ruben Carter, the number one contender. Vito Anafermo upset Jake LaMotta. That was a hell of a fight. Uh, Graziano will... He was, we didn't vacate his title yet, so we'll keep him as USBA middleweight champion. We'll give him a title defense. Sugar Ray Robinson, um, we're going to give... We may go robinson Monzone, but maybe we give him a, a, a slightly lesser opponent. Tommy Hearns has not fared well. He's 1-2 he's at middleweight and 0-1 and at light heavyweight. But Ruben Carter is the number one contender. And that's probably up next in the Battle of the Baldies 2. Again, the Battle of the Baldies 1 was uh, Briscoe, Bernie Briscoe, and Hagler. But it's going to be Carter and Hagler. Antifermo cannot fight, will not fight for the title because he really fought Hagler twice. So I don't, again, I don't do fights that really happened. I try to stay away from that. So ha Antifermo is hoping for someone to beat Hagler. That was a hell, he, I couldn't, that was a shocking upset, Antifermo. Uh, won that majority's points. Uh, Antifermo has beat uh, James Hard Rock Green split decision and Jake LaMotta majority points. One of my favorites, Frank the Animal Fletcher, last fight he lost to Hagler for the USBA title. But he upset Hearns and he upset Bobby Boogaloo Watts. Uh, let's look at the heavyweights and then we'll call it a stream. 
So Gene Tunney's a champ. Joe Louis, the number one contender. He'll get a title shot in the near future. Gene Tunney just finished beating Joe Frazier. So then we're going to give Tunney... We're going to go... Um, we're going to give Tunney a defense of his choice. We have to have a rematch with Shavalo and Lewis. They fought to a draw for the British Commonwealth title. And there'll be a rematch this time at Wembley Stadium. The first fight took place at Rogers Center. That was a hell of a fight card. Primo Canera has to defend his European title. We don't know against who yet. but So, so Gene Tunney... Ah, uh, Lee's the NABF champ. He beat Taylor Filo Stevenson. I, I don't know who we're going to fight Tunney against yet. I mean, I like to throw Rocky Marciano against him, but uh, I like to give someone else a shot. And I like to see Ali win it. Uh, Ali probably is going to fight. We'll figure out who he fights. Let's see, what would be an interesting fight for Gene Tunney? So Tunney, <clears throat> nine and a nine. All right, so, and he's a tactician. Uh, Jimmy Young lost his last fight. Larry Holmes, maybe, maybe that. And again, that's not an easy fight. Nine and a nine. That would be uh, interesting. So we'll figure it out. Again, when I put my fight cards together. Oh, yeah. That is interesting. Uh, you bring up a good point there, Dwayne Martz, about Vito Antifermo. I would consider him an aggressive fighter, possibly dirty. Yeah. Vito was a tough cookie. Let's go back to that. I think they give him average. I mean, he wasn't flagrantly dirty, but he was tough. You want to see a dirt? Fritz Zivic. <laughs> Welterweight. Uh, you're right. That's wow. You have good eyes there. So Vito, average foul, which is fair. I think I don't think he was too dirty of a fighter. I watched many of his fights. Now welterweights, we had a fun upset in our welterweight championship when we did that. Nino Larocca beat Roberto Duran. That was a hell of a fight. So we got to give Larocca a title defense in Italy. Or Mon we're going to give it him in Italy. So we don't, we're not going to have him fight Hearns or Robinson or any of those because he ain't going to win that. Let's give him someone. We might go Nino LaRocca against, um, I, I like this one, Pepino Cuevas. Nino LaRocca and Pepino Cuevas. That's been in my head. Um, so there you have it. Let's go back to schedule here, here. That's our fight card. Tony Martin said, I had a boxing game called Boxing Enterprise in the 70s. Cards and Dice. Ooh, very cool. I never heard of that one. So thank you very much. I'd like to thank Tony Martin, Dwayne Martz, Golden Eagle 99, HC0023, RJL Network, our good friend Rob. Check out his wonderful channel. Zalapsky Smurf, thank you. Cutter Historical. We got to do, uh, I believe his birthday is coming up April 9th. Happy early birthday to you, my friend. And he wants a Canadian card. We'll try to do that. Um, again, I don't promise things. I try things. <clears throat> SGJ Jamie, thank you very much. Jim L. Hope all as well. John Wise was here. Phantom Fighter, another fun channel in our community. Double... J <laughs> Dyslexia is great. J Double A. Jeff Ray. And Brian Patterson. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Greatly appreciate your time. Stay safe, be smart. Treat people the way you want to be treated. We'll be back pretty soon. We're going to do some more streaming today. Um, God bless. I love you all. What a fight card. Glad you enjoyed it. You know what's coming, folks. Peace! 